expect major new career opportunities. So these struggles over language policy and over what will be the official languages and in what realms these languages will be required is really a major struggle over educational and professional opportunities. Uh, and as you can see, it also has enormous potential for pitting different groups against each other. Uh, and then finally, sort of one of the great sort of problems that is going to come to the forefront in, in all of these societies um, is going to be the whole question of the protection of minority rights. Uh, in all of these countries, which uh, at best are going to have very fragile um, political democracies for the next few years, uh, and which are only beginning to try to create states in which legal norms uh, will come to play an important role. Uh, and in which you won't have a system of arbitrary and highly politicized forms of legal protection. Uh, the whole question of how to protect minority rights, whether there will be legal or political institutions sufficiently strong and effective uh, to actually protect minority rights is really emerging uh, as a major issue. And I think this is going to be a period in which minorities all over this part of the world will be especially vulnerable. Let me just conclude by saying that uh, if I've painted a very grim picture, uh, it's because I genuinely believe that this is going to be, that all of these problems are not only extremely difficult, but are likely to be exacerbated by all of the political and economic turmoil in the region. Uh, I think they're going to be very acute in Eastern Europe. They will be especially acute in the Soviet Union, which is really facing a serious prospect of disintegration with all of the complicated uh, consequences that could have for the rest of the continent, for global relations, uh, for the military stability and military security in the continent. Uh, in the Soviet case, there are a number of alternative scenarios that one could imagine, but it is unclear at this point whether either the, Gor the scenario that Gorbachev is trying to promote which involves renegotiating the terms of the federation, uh, but preserving a strong central authority, uh, or the Yeltsin strategy, which involves basically bilateral negotiations between the Russian Republic and all of the other republics, whether either of those strategies is likely to be effective. Uh, and as I say, in any case, the situation of minorities in all of these regions will be very precarious. Uh, I think that the United States and, West, and the West in general has an enormous stake in the stability of this region, that if there is tremendous turmoil and instability and violence in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, it will inevitably spill over into Western Europe. There is no way to contain these problems within Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. We could see massive waves of migrants uh, of various minority groups uh, streaming westward, uh, putting enormous pressure on all of the West European governments as well as the United States, uh, which could conceivably lead to the erection of a new Iron Curtain, this time erected by the West to protect itself against this flood of refugees from the East. Um, there are enormous ecological problems which cannot help but spill over into the West. Uh, the economic, tremendous economic disruptions in this region cannot but help affect the prospects of economic stabilization in the European community as well as the United States. And then there is above all a tremendous security problem posed by the presence in the Soviet Union of massive quantities, not only of conventional weapons but of nuclear weapons, and the question of whether their security can be guaranteed if there is a really breakdown of central authority and explosive ethnic conflicts. For all of these reasons, I think all of us have a great stake in the future development of this entire region and a great stake in taking on a major role in helping to create new institutions that might be able to play some more effective role in helping to stabilize this region and in helping to the, the states of this region to manage these problems that will arise out of nationalist uh, self-assertion uh, in a way that will not only give the processes of economic um, marketization and political democratization 
uh, a more, create a more favorable climate for these developments, but also to stabilize the entire European situation because it is so much in our common interest. Thank you. be delighted to answer any questions that you might like to raise. Why don't we start in the back? Go ahead. Is there a Jewish nationalism? And where is the geographical center to you? Well, there is, um, in, the, in the Soviet Union, of course, the Jews have been largely a dispersed uh, nationality. There was an attempt, uh, as, as you may know, to create a Jewish homeland in Biro Bijan, but it never uh, took any serious hold in the Soviet Union because it was so completely artificial and unconnected thank you, uh, to, uh, to sort of any Jewish tradition. So there are still some substantial Jewish communities in Moscow, in some of the other cities of the Russian Republic, scattered in the Baltic Republics and elsewhere, still relatively in Georgia and elsewhere, relatively small. But what you have been seeing in the past few years is a sort of growing self-assertion in this climate of greater tolerance and less repression uh, of Jewish identity, just as you've seen assertions of identity by other national groups, even groups without homelands like Soviet Koreans, Soviet Germans, and so on. Um, and in the last few years, this has been given much greater it has been much more tolerated and even encouraged in some cases by local authorities. So you've had the establishment of the first Jewish uh, yeshivas uh, in the Soviet Union openly. Um, Hebrew is no longer, the use of Hebrew as a language is no longer banned. Uh, religious instruction, it's now possible to offer some religious instruction to young people. Uh, various cultural and other associations have been organized in a number of uh, Russian cities, Jewish groups of various kinds, and there was last December the first national congress of Jewish organizations. So you're beginning to see the sort of limited development of new communal associations for Jews as well as for uh, a variety of other nationalities in the Soviet Union that don't have their own territorial homeland. Uh, but in the case of Jews, as in the case of some others, there's still a good deal of fear about what will happen, well, sort of fear that if this, uh, that if, um, uh, if the situation is exacerbated, if central authority breaks down, if Gorbachev and the Gorbachev reforms are kicked aside, that there could well be a nationalist populist backlash which will place them in great danger. So, and, and I think this is why you see side by side with the growing expressions of Jewish identity, also a growing wave of emigration on the part of Jews who are simply too fearful to stay and uh, want to leave the country for, for the United States, for Israel, or for anywhere else they can go. Yeah, go ahead. Are there any of the Well, I, I mean, obviously, the um, the ones that will have the least <laughs> the least problems are those that have the fewest sort of foreign nationalities. East Germany, um, in many ways, is likely to be the easiest um, for for a great variety of reasons. Poland is more homogeneous, for example, than um, many of the others are. Um, I think it's a little bit hard to say. It depends so much on how these developments evolve. Uh, and, and what relations, in, how relations in the region develop. I mean, the whole question of what happens to the Transylvanian major, uh, minority really depends on the, relation, the kinds of relations that are established between Hungary and, and uh, several of the other East European states. I think it's very hard to predict. I mean, obviously, Yugoslavia is going to go through an extremely traumatic time because the whole question of what its boundaries, will, what, what will happen to Yugoslavia, whether it will remain together in any way, uh, or whether it will fragment into pieces, and if so, into what pieces, uh, remains a major problem. But I think none of these countries are going to have an easy time of it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, what do you think about huh? the possibility of having European countries to offer economic aid? I know a lot of them are thinking about that, but they're afraid to channel it to Moscow. 
I mean, economic aid to the Soviet Union or to other countries in Eastern Europe? To the Soviet Union, Well, I think, uh, I mean, I think there has been serious discussion in, uh, in Western capitals about uh, aid to Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, and there has been some fairly substantial economic assistance already been channeled and, and, and more will be channeled to Poland, to Hungary, probably to Czechoslovakia. Uh, also, uh, I think that one of that that uh, in a sense the rapid changes in East Germany uh, have more or less diverted the interest of the West German government, which might earlier have been in a, both in a position to help uh, some of the other East European countries and have been prepared to do so on a large scale. But with the sudden changes in Eastern Germany, the costs of absorbing and transforming Eastern Germany, which is of course the West German government's highest priority. Uh, are absolutely massive, and I think that has really diverted a good deal of attention away from uh, a German role in parts of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Uh, I think the United States has been um, ha has been uh, sort of much more cautious in uh, approaching this whole problem, and everyone has been more cautious vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union than parts of Eastern Europe. I think until now there has been the feeling that any aid channeled to the Soviet Union in any significant way would simply go to strengthen the old institutions rather than to strengthen the forces of reform. Uh, but I think that as the Soviet situation becomes more critical and there is a serious danger of food shortages, energy shortages, tremendous unrest in the Soviet Union this winter, I think people are more and more beginning, governments are beginning more and more to think about the possibility that massive infusions of aid may be needed this winter in the Soviet Union as well, and are trying to think more constructively about how to channel this aid so that it would strengthen reform-oriented governments, either in the republics or in some of the major cities, and not simply strengthen the hands of the central bureaucracy. But I think to the extent that the Soviet leadership takes more radical movements in the direction of marketization and economic reform, I think there will be a greater Western commitment. I must say, though, that, that here the whole crisis in the Persian Gulf is really very deeply intertwined with the fate of developments in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, because I think just at a moment when Western governments were indeed organizing themselves and getting poised to focus on this region and to offer various kinds of, of assistance, the Persian Gulf crisis has really diverted not only attention but also massive resources to this other region. And I think that is enormously complicating develop the whole uh, prospect of, of assistance in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Yeah. Well, I think until now, first of all, I think the Baltic republics have until now been treated as a separate and distinct case because the juridical status of those three republics is different from those of all of the others. And even there, Western governments have been extremely cautious and hesitant to uh, recognize uh, these governments uh, and have basically sort of taken the standard sort of diplomatic view that until these governments can demonstrate that they are indeed in control of their territories, it would not be appropriate to extend full rec diplomatic recognition. So I think there is sort of a very complicated diplomatic game <coughs> being played out in which these governments are uh, sort of actively engaged in uh, trying to build support in Scandinavia and in Western Europe, trying to extend economic ties, setting up information uh, agencies and missions and little by little trying to make themselves more of a presence and excuse me and to get their status upgraded. Uh, they've asked to be recognized to be given observer status at these CSE meetings in, in Europe and so on. Um, I think everyone is trying to be cautious because they don't want to do anything that would re seriously undermine Gorbachev's authority or create serious diplomatic problems. Um, in any case 
I think that that until the that, that the Baltic is likely to re the Baltic republics are likely to remain the focus of most of these diplomatic efforts. Now, when you get to Georgia, Georgia is really in a situation somewhat like a number of other republics, and there, in order to extend serious diplomatic recognition, I think both the, the United States and other countries would have to be prepared to see the dismemberment of the Soviet Union. And I think there are lots of real concerns about whether this would be to anyone's interest. And I don't think it is really being seriously contemplated so far. My guess is that what we'll see in the next few years are efforts to broaden the scope of our contacts with the various republics of the Soviet Union. Uh, perhaps not to limit our ties as exclusively as we have until now to Moscow, but to begin to perhaps set up information agencies or uh, cultural exchanges, educational exchanges, some economic ties with the different republics of the Soviet Union. In effect, to cultivate a much broader network of contacts without having them take on diplomatic forms. Yeah. Would you like to add to your list of woes a certain disease perspective? Oh dear, I've, I've gotten myself so depressed, I'm not sure I want to see the list even longer. <laughs> it afflicts the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe as well as here. And it's, uh, I'm talking about racism, pure and simple. But in addition to the inter ethnic animosity, uh, there's a racism that's, that's rooted in ignorance and spurred by those economic problems. But there are a lot of students. Studying the Soviet Union, and they're the victims of uh, often horrible racism. And, uh, this type of racism is, is, is pervasive, unfortunately. Uh, it's a diplomatic point of view. Yeah, and my, my guess, my guess, however, is that the numbers of those students studying in the Soviet Union is going to diminish very sharply the over the years ahead because the so. The what? Yeah, the attitudes are there. I think the numbers will diminish partly because the Soviet government will no, no longer sees it to its advantage to subsidize large number of students. I mean, at a time when their own educational institutions are disintegrating because of budget crises to spend the millions that have been spent, say, on La Mamba University, um, you know, would be, would be seen as impossible to sustain. So I think the numbers will diminish, but you're absolutely right. I think, again, <clears throat> some of that racism was disguised for many years by this whole official mythology of equality and harmony, but there are, you know, endless stories of the tremendous sort of victimization and abuse that African students have suffered in the Soviet Union. Yes, you had a question back there. Um, yeah, I know that in this country, when you have different ethnic groups going at each other like this, generally it's orchestrated for specific reasons. Uh, the, the city of Chicago, Because the German, uh, the Indian Germans in Chicago were trying to unionize, and uh, there were riots with Germans as victims. Anyway, uh, uh, this repeats consistently through our history. And I'm curious uh, if you have the same things going on in the Soviet Union, where you've got ethnic groups that assure there's tension and has been for generations, but they pretty well left each other alone for a long time. Who's stirring this up? Who is benefiting from these riots and this unrest and all this ugliness suddenly allowed to emerge? Or do we need to go region by region? <clears throat> Well, I think, first of all, the question that you've raised, and particularly the way you've raised it, has been raised many times in the Soviet Union on all sides of the issue. Very often, right-wing sort of conservatives will get up and say, well, you know, all of these years we've had nothing but harmony and peace among all our ethnic groups, and now suddenly things are getting stirred up. Uh, who is doing it? <laughs> sort of who is doing it? Um, and often Soviet newspapers, publications, and even individuals will say, ah, it's all the work of the mafias. Uh, the people who favor perestroika will argue that it's all the work of the conservatives. They're trying to discredit perestroika, discredit Gorbachev, discredit reforms by, by demonstrating that reform and democratization will simply lead to violence and chaos, and therefore 
uh, they're orchestrating it in order to return the country to authoritarian rule. Um, the reformers will make the opposite argument. They will ar argue that it's the, uh, and in fact, each side will argue that the other side has an interest in fomenting all of this. And it's really very hard to get to the bottom of this problem. I do think that the circumstances differ very much from one region of the country to another. Uh, take, for example, the situation in the Baltic republics <coughs> and the, the rise of this Russian-dominated movement. Uh, inter, it's called Interfront. Uh, it's basically, I would argue, a movement of the military-industrial complex in the Baltic republics, largely dominated by Russians, but also by retired military officers, by the management of the Russian military plants in the Baltic Republic, who are threat and, and enterprises which rely very heavily on large numbers of migrant work, not migrant workers, uh, migrants, workers who are brought in from the Russian Republic and other parts of the country to staff these factories. They live in Russian-speaking enclaves, they attend Russian schools, they have virtually no contact, let's say, with Estonians or Latvians or Lithuanians. And they're violently opposed to these national movements in the Baltic because if they are successful, these enterprises would be driven out, they would be forced to go back to Russia. Uh, they now enjoy a much higher living standard because conditions are better in the Baltic than they would be in Russia. So these movements are fighting the, uh, the Baltic people's fronts. Well, clearly the central government or parts of the central government are behind them. When these factories, when the workers at these factories announced the strike, very mysteriously, the workers were getting paid uh, through this whole period when they were on strike. Well, clearly the central ministries were making sure that they didn't go without support. Uh, so there I think, you know, there is enough evidence so that you can piece together a clear picture of what's going on. In the case of Central Asia, it's much more ambiguous. You don't know whether local political elites trying to preserve their old network of power and authority are deliberately orchestrating these events, or whether they really are spontaneous, whether some of them at least, I mean obviously they must have ringleaders and so on, but there are many forms of mob violence that are often triggered by you know, a quarrel in a marketplace over the price of strawberries in which uh, you know, you've got uh, someone of an outside nationality selling strawberries and people are feeling aggrieved and they say, you know, you're an exploiter and the guy shouts back, I am not, this is what it costs and some other people jump on him and he pulls out a knife and they pull out knives and before you know it there are hundreds and hundreds of people involved in mob violence. So it's very hard, I mean I really do think you have to look, sit, you know, look at these situations almost case by case because it's all too easy to fall back on these larger, on these larger explanations. And one could argue that, that and factions using the situation, every one of them is enormously complex. Yeah. In, in some cases, I think it was only covered, covered up on the surface, but the emotions were always very strong, for instance, in Pennsylvania. There are, there are publishing houses here, there are uh, journals here published uh, by groups, Hungarian groups in this country. They have sent petitions to the Congress over the years, and uh, they are very, very aware of the problem of the Hungarian in Pennsylvania and have been already dealing, but mm -hmm. nobody has listened to it. Mm -hmm. And I think the same has been true in the Baltic and elsewhere. Uh, on the other hand, there are some places where, where there are some real surprises. For example, the Ukraine has turned out to be a great surprise to people who follow the Soviet Union. I think it was always assumed that the Western, if, you know, if you remember the history of this, uh, of this region, the Eastern Ukraine was a heavily Russified area that had been part of the Soviet Union uh, going back to, uh, to a much earlier period. But the Western Ukraine was the territory that was added to the Soviet Union after World War II. It was the territory, in effect, taken from Poland when Poland's borders were moved westward. Uh, and so it was always assumed that there was a good deal of Ukrainian nationalist sentiment in the Western Ukraine, but that the Eastern Ukraine would be relatively impervious to it, that their Ukrainian culture had died out, the language wasn't used, no one was interested in it anymore, you know, that you, that part of the Ukraine thought of itself as Russian. Well, I think to everyone's surprise, uh, Kiev and this part of the Ukraine has also been caught up in this wave 
of Ukrainian national assertion. So I think some of the sentiment was always there and was just concealed below the surface, and some of it is being newly created by this new political environment. Why don't we take the one all the way yeah. in the back? Um, I was wondering, do you think a significant portion of Eastern Europe can successfully accomplish economic reform by can, economic can successfully accomplish what? Economic reform without, well, just by internal movements and so forth, without opening up to the rest of the world for aid and massive amounts of uh, foreign investment? Well, I think it's you know, one would hesitate to answer, you know, to say that these countries are incapable of making it on their own, but I, I do feel that their prospects are, uh, in many cases, in most cases, extremely dim, given how painful and protracted a process it is without the, both sort of the leverage and the kind of support, as well as the concrete assistance that would be, uh, that, uh, that, that, that would come from substantial Western economic help. So I, I do think that the West is import, has got to be importantly in, evolved in the process and that Western assistance can make uh, a very considerable difference. I think it would be very difficult for them to do it entirely without that outside assistance. But it can come in a great variety of forms. It needn't come only in the form of direct governmental uh, aid. It could come in the form of various kinds of, econo uh, of uh, private assistance, various forms of foreign uh, investment, uh, joint ventures uh, of, of a variety of kinds, technical assistance. Okay.